go to Sun Studio, what do you say? Well, there aren't many buildings that can say they changed the course of history, but this is one of them. Another bucket lister for me, going to Sun Studios. Now this was started by an amazing man named Sam Phillips who got a start in Muscle Shoals, which is also known as a wonderful um, historical recording studio area. But Sam came to Memphis when he was growing up and he loved Beale Street and he always kept that in his mind. And so as he grew up, he ended up becoming a DJ, a radio DJ and became pretty popular. Yep, that's Elvis, baby. Along with Johnny Cash and uh, Carl Perkins, Jerry Lee Lewis. So Sam Perkins is, or Sam Phillips is responsible for all this. And what ended up happening was he got offered his dream job here in Memphis, started playing records and became extremely popular. And what he realized was that he thought, hey, I can make records just as good as the people that are recording them out there now. He put his money where his mouth was. Yep, Roy Orbison as well. So at the time, this area was mainly all mechanic shops, and so Sam took over this building over here, and he started what was called the Memphis Recording Service. And with that, anyone that had $3 for one side or $4 for a second side could come here and just walk right in off the street and record. Now at that time, he was just recording music. He didn't have a label and never wanted one. He was recording music for um, just anyone who had the money to come in and if he thought that the music was good, he was helping to get it deals with RPM. And so one of the first people that he ever discovered and helped out was a man who would later be known as B.B. King. Now Sam ended up hiring in the early 50s Ike Turner to be his talent scout. And Ike Turner would go combing cities, going to pool halls and going to churches looking for great singers. And there he discovered Howlin' Wolf, who was in his mid 40s, he'd never recorded anything. He brought him to Sam, Sam recorded him and Howlin' Wolf became a blues staple. Now eventually Sam recorded so many records and was selling them so often that he never really considered that one thing you couldn't do was let somebody record the same song twice and sell it to two labels and he did that the song both recordings became a hit and a lawsuit came about and um, it really threw Sam's business for a loop and so he decided after this forget all that I'm just gonna start my own recording studio and it became Sun Records now he also in order to facilitate this he had to keep the um, he had to keep the idea of letting people just come in off the street to record so that he could make money while he was trying to build up this studio and his record label while he's investing money and one of the guys who came in and paid that three dollars to record a side was Elvis Presley. He came in here to record a song for his mother's birthday. Sam's partner um, loved Elvis's voice and she wrote down that he had a wonderful ballad voice and to save it in case they needed somebody like him for future recordings. So for a year they never called Elvis, they never had him come in for an audition or anything, never to record anything and um, as I said the partner here was a huge fan of Elvis. She liked his voice and was every chance she got trying to influence Sam to, hey remember that boy with a good voice? Trying to get him in here and it never worked until Scotty Moore came here and she arranged a like a luncheon with Elvis and Scotty Moore. They hit it off and Scotty said, you know what, I think I can get Sam to listen to you. Come in tomorrow and we'll get you an audition. So Elvis came in the next day while they were messing around and Sam was kind of replacing tapes and getting ready to uh, record this audition, Elvis busts out into That's All Right Mama and he's beating on that guitar and I love that guitar because look, it's got the, uh, that was the leather covered guitar with his name on it. He's doing that song and all of a sudden Sam realizes that this is the voice he's always been looking for. What he wanted was he knew to help bridge the gap of black and white and music. He knew that what he thought he was looking for was a black guy who sounded white. But when he heard Elvis, he said, no, what I think I need is a white guy who can sound African American and people will forget. People will see him and they'll forget and they'll love the music. They recorded the song, it became a big hit. 
Elvis continued to record a few hits with him, and then Colonel Parker started um, spreading a rumor that Elvis was looking to sign with a new label. And so Sam Phillips said, Tom, why are you telling people this? You know it's not true. And he said, well, what do you think? I mean, don't you want to sell Elvis? And, uh, and Sam said, well, maybe for the right price. And so Colonel Parker got RCA to offer an unprecedented $35,000, which is what Sam requested thinking that nobody would ever <laughs> go for that. And, um, and they set a record by buying the contract of Elvis Presley. Elvis did one last song, which was Mystery Train. That, of course, was a hit. And Elvis went on to have a great career with RCA. Sam Phillips used that money to help build the studio as well as buy stock in Holiday Inn, which is what ended up making him a ton of money eventually. So I don't know what the deal is with the uh, tours, whether they let you film them or not, but we'll find out. Let's go. Then once Elvis was established, then Carl Perkins started recording here. Then Johnny Cash came here to record a gospel album and Roy Orbison, Jerry Lee Lewis. I mean, it became historic. Sun Studios Cafe. Take a look at this. Look at that crew. And this is one of the jobs that Elvis had when he was here in Memphis before his music career took off. He worked for this company and this is the original sign. How about that? He was a truck driver for them. Good deal on the shirts. Buy three, get one free. Oh, and this is great. Check this out. A little history here before it was Sun Records. Sam's history of the Rocket 88s and Ike Turner and all that stuff. There's Jerry Lee Lewis. So it looks like the deal is you can do photos upstairs, but no filming. But I think you can film inside the studio, so we'll find out. Taylor's Fine Foods. That was one of Sam's radio stations. And the name Dewey Phillips up there, he's not related to Sam, but he's the man who was uh, getting the song played on the radio. That's all right, Mama. To make it a hit, he played it over and over. The real Gene Simmons. <laughs> wow. A lot of hits made here. A lot of hits. That one's signed by Johnny. Look at that. Best wishes, Johnny Cash. Slim Whitman, and then that one above it signed by Carl Perkins. This is a picture of Carl Perkins with his Cadillac and it says that uh, Sam Phillips made an offer to his artist that he would give a brand new Cadillac to the first Sun artist to sell a million records. And uh, Blue Suede Shoes did it in 1955. And then this is all a copy of Elvis' RCA contract when Sam sold him in 1955. And here it's signed by Vernon and Elvis. And Sam was also responsible for WHER, the very first woman's radio station. Oh, and by the way, U2 recorded Rattle and Hum here, if you're a U2 fan. So the tour starts here in the record shop, and uh, if it turns into photos, you'll see the photos. All right, this is the entryway to WHBQ, which was Dewey's radio station. He was the one that got Elvis played on the radio and he used to play everything by anything Sun Records. Always played every single record. That's his actual um, control room, his office, and those were the original glass doors. Which is kind of cool. He would have actually been, and they said he was a total wacko, total oddball, like crazy man. They said he would play records that he'd never heard before and if he liked him he would sing off key and um, sing along and everything but if he hated him he would smash the record on his microphone and then throw the pieces on the ground and just berate the record for the next 15 minutes but they said for the most part he always loved all the Sun Records stuff. Him and Sam were great friends and that's the other side of his little uh, crazy person station. And there's an ad for the Dizzy Dean Show and, of course, Dewey Phillips. There's Dewey, Natalie Wood, and Elvis together. And then I just bolted over to the Elvis section because I saw they had Elvis's cardigan that he's wearing right there. 
and everybody else was on the other side, so I ran over and got to the Elvis stuff first. Now check that out, that's Elvis's amplifier, and then some of the contracts, and then that is his extremely famous guitar from 1956 that we saw in the photo outside. On loan from Graceland, look at that, that Elvis um, leather imprint, that's so great. Here's some paperwork from Tom Parker. And then this is Sam Phillips and Elvis and the guys all recording in the studio. I just love this guitar because that leather casing was, you can see it says it's cowhide on loan from Graceland. Buddy Holly loved that so much that he actually made one of those for his guitars as well. And eventually Gary Busey, who played Buddy Holly, bought that guitar and has it now. And there's an 18 year old Elvis. They had this picture because that's when he first came to the studio. He had a trucking job and he was also um, 18 years old coming to sing a song for his mom and that was Sam Phillips' partner who was his secretary and she was the one that liked Elvis's voice when he came to do that song for his mom and wrote down Good Ballad Ear which was probably a bad idea because Sam hated ballads but she was the one that ended up hooking up Scotty Moore and Elvis together that eventually got him that contract. Now this is the Prisoners. They were a group of guys actually literally in prison that were making a name for themselves recording and Sam Phillips heard about them, made a deal with the warden to let them come to the studio to record. They had to be in shackles and they had a guard behind them with a rifle. Uh, but they recorded a couple of hit songs with Sam and Elvis himself was a huge fan of them and he used to hang out at the studio all the time. So when he knew they were going to be down there, he came down there and befriended the Prisoners. There's Elvis and some of the guys, there's an old close and play kind of deal for Sun Records. They didn't really go into that guitar or this saxophone, but I assume they were used on recordings. And then this is the very first release by Sun Records, Johnny London. Pretty good song, but it wasn't a hit. And then this was some of the people that he worked with, Howlin' Wolf, and you can see um, Joe Hill Lewis, and then also this is where, what he recorded um, Rocket 88 on which became the song that actually, as you see right here, Rocket 88 by Jackie Brenston and his Delta Cats was considered to be the first rock and roll song. And it went to number one in the summer of 51, so Sam Phillips could actually quit his job. But even though it was named after Jackie Brenston, it was Ike Turner's band. So yeah, Ike Turner was the leader of it, but Jackie Brenston had the name to it. <laughs> Crazy. And this is a Chess Records label. Usually Sam would get people on RPM, but sometimes he would get them on Chess. And this was in the days before he had his own Sun Studio, Sun Record. Now that amplifier you see back there, that's the one they used for Rocket 88. And how they got that sound was it was broken. It fell off the car on the way to the studio. It was broken and it was coming out distorted. Sam threw some newspaper and it liked the sound, recorded it, and that became the trademark. And then this is him describing how Sam loved to go to Beale Street and he found this boy, Riley King, and got him on RPM. He recorded B.B. King and that was B.B. King's guitar. How crazy, he was behind B.B. King's success. And there's various stages of B.B. King's career. And there's a very young B.B. King, look at him. And B.B. was always known to sit down while he played, so this was really cool that they had a signed 1993 chair of B.B. King's. And then this was a controversy, Bearcat, this got Sam sued. This was a re retort to Hound Dog, but it was almost identical, so he got sued for plagiarism and uh, and ended up having to pay like 1,200 bucks or 12,000 bucks actually, which was a ton of money then. There's Sam working with his um, reel-to-reel -reel equipment, there's his lathe, and then the reel-to-reel -reel machine we just saw him with is right there. And that was the original Sun Studio, what he would have recorded tape on. This is when Memphis Recording Service, before it was Sun, this was their original business card. And that was the original sign for the, uh, the front window that we saw. Now this was his portable unit. Sam, when he first started the recording service, he would go anywhere. He would record weddings, sermons, anything he could do to make money. And so he had a portable unit. This was the advertisement for that service. And he was a success with it. And that was the portable unit that he used to take with him. Hard worker, man, no doubt. Then there's the original storefront, and there's Sam himself inside the studio. Also Sam. And then there's some paperwork, an invoice. Any questions? Now we're heading down into the famous studio where 
all those classic Sun Records songs are recorded. Here's the lobby. That would have been Marion Kiesler's area. And those are all the artists that used to record here. There's Elvis, Sam, and Marion. All right, in the studio we go. And it's an active studio, so the uh, instruments are not just for show, it's literally people record here. Look at that. There's all the uh, sound barriers over there. Wow. Elvis would have recorded his first song in here. Not only his first recording, but his first hit. <laughs> they said after he recorded, that's all right, mama, he went around telling everybody, went home and said, I just recorded my first hit. <laughs> he knew. Look, there's an upright bass. I wonder if that's the microphone. I know Sam always used the same vocal microphone. Um, it was a Sure 55, I think. I wonder if that's it. I know that they get, they have it here somewhere, so maybe we'll get to see it on this tour. And then there's the recording booth in there that Sam would have been in while everyone was recording. Oh, we've got some more microphones. It could have been any one of these. Wow. Take a look in there. That's the control room. That is so cool. Look inside there. You can see, I mean, pretty much everything. You can see where all the tape machines were and everything, and now they've got computers and monitors for recording. Oh, that's awesome. That's the Class of 55 album. You see Carl, Jerry Lee Lewis, Ray Orbison, Johnny Cash. Look, there's the Million Dollar Quartet, that one night that they all hung out, and there's the piano that Elvis is playing right there. Awesome, isn't that? And then this is a view from where the drums are looking at the uh, receptionist area and you can even see the front, <laughs> the sidewalk where we started and an old Pepsi machine in there. So they allow 40 people on the tour so we've got a full room. When Elvis Presley, Scotty Moore and Bill Black finally got into the studio, Sam had them stand in a very specific formation. Scotty Moore on the electric guitar, he stood there on that X. It's over there, trust me. Uh, Bill Black on the upright bass, he stood on yeah, yeah. that thing. That's where his bass rested that day. Yeah. That makes this floor the original floor from the 1950s. And that makes this spot the very best spot. That was Presley's spot. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that one. Uh, when the guys finally got settled, Sam Phillips had them start playing and they started recording. They are playing mostly gospel music and, and country ballads. Sam Phillips hated every single minute of it, and he told the guys to take a break, which in the music industry pretty much meant that you blew it. <laughs> so Scotty and Bill, they started packing up their instruments. These guys were almost out of the room by the time Elvis started playing this very obscure blues song, a song by Arthur Big Boy Crudup, a song called That's All Right. Nobody in the room knew the song. Scotty and Bill had never heard it, but Sam Phillips knew it, and he loved it. He came busting out of that door right there. He ran right up to Elvis. He told them to play it louder and to play it faster, and that is exactly what they did. They made it a rock and roll song. They got Scotty and Bill back in the studio, taught them how to play it, and just after a few takes, got it perfect. And with the single test copy, Sam took it to his buddy, Dewey Phillips, over at WHBQ, and it aired for the very first time on July 8, 1954. If you were a teenager at the time listening to WHBQ, Red Hot and Blue, it would have sounded a little bit like this. Uh, please bear with Dewey. Like I said upstairs, he's crazy. He's also the most southern person I've ever heard. And it took me two years to figure out what he's saying. You've got 30 seconds, so good luck. <laughs> Oh, yes, I got people so full of such bring the hottest cotton picking thing in the country. Red hot blue coming to WHBQ in Hotel Chisco. All right, it's okay, nervous. Nope. All right, just go down and get you a wheelbarrow load of mad offs and flip and get it. Well, that's all right, Mama. All right. That's all right. That's all right. As you can imagine, this song was a huge success. Dewey Phillips, he got nonstop calls to play it again. Hear me right when I say this, Dewey Phillips played it on the radio 14 times <coughs> in just three hours, wow. which is ridiculous. I mean, Sam knew that this meant something special, so he signed Elvis to a three-year contract here at Sun, to which Elvis only stayed for about 17 months before his contract was then sold to RCA for $35,000. And in hindsight, that seems stupid, but you gotta remember this is 1955. $35,000 was a fortune and Sam needed the money desperately. He was in pretty significant financial debt, partially due to the Bearcat lawsuit. And with the 35, he was able to pay all that off and hire new employees, buy new equipment, but most importantly, 
Say was able to just pay his bills to keep the doors open, to bring in new musicians. People like that man right there, Carl Perkins. Now, Carl, he had the very first gold record hit on the Sun Record Company label. And I truly believe he is one of the most underrated and underappreciated musicians of his time, if not of all time. The guy is absolutely fantastic. I dare you to go home, wherever that is, and find somebody that does not know his gold record hit and can't do it. They won't know it by Carl, and that's a shame. They'll know his song, though. It's a song called Blue Suede Shoes. <laughs> Carl Perkins wrote it. Carl Perkins sang it first. Carl Perkins sold more copies in Elvis Presley at the time. And Carl Perkins topped more charts than Elvis ever did. And in my opinion, and I truly hope I don't hurt your feelings, Carl did Blue Suede Shoes just a tiny bit better. Don't hate him. The next one, you laugh, I've been booed before on that one. Uh, the next big artist to record here at Sun was, of course, Johnny Cash. That's him there, sitting on a stool, just in case you somehow have forgotten what Johnny Cash looked like. Now, Johnny Cash, he recorded songs here like Folsom Prison Blues, Hey Porter, Cry, 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 Get Rhythm, Big River. I mean, th those are some of my favorite Johnny Cash songs. Not to mention this little number I'm, I'm sure you've all heard a million times or more, called I Walk the Line. It's not a snare drum, it's not a drum at all, and I've had a lot of people guess as to what it is. Most go straight to maracas. Which is a fine guess. It makes sense rhythmically and sound-wise. It's not quite right. I do, I do love the mental image of Johnny Cash up on a stage. <laughs> <laughs> Shake some it's a great uh, Back in the '50s, drums were almost completely outlawed from country music. Everybody's heard of the Grand Ole Opry, right? Uh -huh. yeah. I think that is the place to go for country music. It, it was founded in 1925, and the Grand Ole Opry did not allow a full drum set onto the front of their stage until 1973 because drums were considered too rock and roll and too blues and country music was structured, it was proper, they didn't want a part of it. They cut them out and there were two things that Johnny Cash wanted more than anything in the world, to play the Grand Ole Opry, of course, and to have that snare drum sound as well. So in order to get around the rule, they came up with this brilliant idea right here. They took an old busted up guitar, a lot like this one, tuned down the strings to really hope little to no tone, it sounds terrible. Then they strung a piece of paper in between the strings themselves, we used the dollar bill just because it looks cool. It works better with a 20. Uh, and this, this is how they got the snare drum sound that they were after. So let's try this one more time, everybody. Johnny Cash, I Walk the Line. Come on. Like I walk this crowd. All right, watch out. Let me go this way. I keep a close watch on this heart of mine. We're in the black shirt. Who remembers his name? Carl Perkins. Carl. Yes, indeed. Carl Perkins, he was here December 4th, 1956, recording his follow-up song, The Blue Suede Shoes, a song called Matchbox, which was later covered by the Beatles. They loved this guy. He's a huge inspiration to him. To the left, we've got Jerry Lee Lewis, who at the time was a nobody. Jerry was just a studio pianist here at Sun, making $8 a day recording music with other musicians. And he was here helping Carl with Matchbox. On December 4th, 1956, Elvis stops in just visiting with the guys on his Christmas break, and Sam Phillips saw an opportunity. Yeah. So he calls two people. One, his biggest star at the time, Johnny Cash, and the other just so happened to be the press. And when the press got here, they took this picture. It was in the paper the next day as the Million Dollar Quartet. But that night, once the press left, you had these four amazing musicians in a room filled with instruments. And they're going to do what they do best, and that is play. And they played for hours. Oh, my God and Sam Press recorded. And I get to play a clip of this night in just a second, but before I do, I want you to know my favorite part about this night, and that is the fact that none of these men knew that they were being recorded. So there's about four hours of audio of them just hanging out, jamming, having a good time. Let, let me tell you, it's one of the coolest things you will ever get to hear. Just to hear the guys have fun without anybody else getting in the way, you can't beat it. The, the clip that I get to play for you starts out with Elvis. And he's telling the guys about a show that he saw in Las Vegas, Jackie Wilson. And Jackie covered an Elvis song with Elvis in the audience, a song called Don't Be Cruel. <laughs> and Elvis thought Jackie Wilson did Don't Be Cruel better. So this is Elvis Presley, who's trying to sound like Jackie Wilson, who's trying to sound like <laughs> Elvis Presley. He <laughs> <laughs> tried so hard, but he got much better, boy. Much better than that record of mine. Oh, no, wait, wait, wait now. It's this way. He was real slender. He got up there and he said, Handle it slow with me. He turned off. He said, uh, What do I keep out doing it? Oh, what keep out doing don't be cruel cool, again? Yeah. Hey, you know I can be found. Wait a Then 
is, of course, Jerry Lee Lewis on the piano. And like I said at the time, he, he was a nobody. But a few short months after this night, Jerry Lee Lewis went on to have the two biggest hits to have ever come out of this room with songs called Great Balls of Fire and a whole lot of shaking going on. Two of my personal favorites. And Jerry kind of brings us to the end of Sun in, in this room here. The year was 1959. Sam and Sun had grown too big for this tiny little space. They took everything that they had. They moved out down the road and they opened up a new spot on Madison. They called it the Sam Phillips Recording Service. It is still active today. It's run by Sam's son, Jerry. And that left this room here musically empty for over 25 years. At one point, this was a barber shop. Uh, then it was a laundromat. For a little while, it was a, a surf shop in Memphis. Oh, it's a bad idea. It's a, <laughs> <laughs> it's a true story. It's like like until, until 1987 rolls around, we started doing tours during the day a lot like this one and recording at night. We've been that way ever since. We've had musicians record here like uh, Maroon 5 and Def Leppard, Paul Simon, Ringo Starr, Beck, Matchbox 20, Chris Isaac, Bonnie Raitt, Tom Petty, Bob Dylan, Margo Price, Ashley Monroe, U2 did a lot of their album, Rattle and Hum in this room. In fact, that blue drum kit back there, that's, that's U2's drum kit. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the Shure 55 microphone. Uh, this is one of the several that Sam Phillips had in the studio during the 50s, but this was Sam's vocal mic, uh, which means that Johnny Cash, Carl Perkins, Jerry Lee Lewis, Roy Orbison, and Elvis Presley himself all had their hands on this mic. They all sang into it and caressed it, spat on it. Uh, <laughs> Sam Phillips left this to us under one condition, that we not put it behind glass and that we allow you guys to take pictures with it. Oh and that is God. exactly what you get to do. Look at that, I get to hold it. The microphone, the Elvis, Johnny Cash, all of them sang through. Glass in the background. There's a story. And there's Bono in here, right in front of that picture. So I guess that's the U2 rattle and hum drum set that they left behind. All right, that's it. Well, we're back in the cafe where they sell all the merch. What a great tour. Well, my friends, I hope you enjoyed this vlog today. This was a real dream come true, especially for me. I mean, I love every person that pretty much recorded here or got started here, and I love the history behind this place. I just love that they have it open for tours. If you can ever make it here, I highly recommend it. You gotta come see where Elvis, Roy, Johnny Cash, Carl Perkins. I mean, come on. That right there says it all. Have a great night, everyone. We will see you all tomorrow. Goodbye.